Well, hello everyone. We're next session in this uh, most interesting congress, uh, virtual congress, is on lipid measurements. And we have a, uh, uh, a world expert to present on the uh, subject of interpretation of clinical laboratory lipid and lipoprotein measurements, who is Associate Professor David Sullivan. He's from the University of Sydney in Sydney, Australia. And, uh, and he is also a pathologist, a chemical pathologist at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Uh, in Sydney and uh, he is going to speak on the this issue and and uh, we will be providing the points of uh, how can the laboratory and the laboratory report uh, achieve the greatest value in, in, in benefiting patients and influencing patient outcome particularly when a uh, when when the patient is being seen by a family practitioner or a general practitioner and so i'd like to welcome uh, david uh, and uh, hand over to you at this time thank you david thank you very much howard and uh, uh good morning everyone or uh, i realize it'll be different times in different parts of the world and uh, so i'm really grateful to the organizers for providing an opportunity to uh, uh, discuss these issues with you today. Uh, it's an exciting venture and I hope I can provide some useful illumination. It's a little bit daunting because uh, I realise that different approaches are uh, adopted around the world. Uh, this was even evident as we prepared the slides and you'll see that uh, we work in SI units but uh, we'll try and uh, uh, convert to mass units um, where appropriate to uh, try and keep things fairly familiar for people. I've just noted my disclosures there and um, I took up Howard's challenge with a little bit of uh, um, uh, uncertainty because I feel that often we're in a situation with uh, results of lipid tests in particular and maybe uh, other tests in general where we're provided with insufficient clinical information on the request form and that the most appropriate interpretation of the results uh, with uh, exercises such as calculating the absolute risk of a cardiovascular disease in the next period of time requires more than just the lab results. And so I guess we prefer to individualise the, the, the information and engage in a patient-specific dialogue rather than invest too much effort in a generalised lab report which I think sometimes clinicians find is less useful. Um, and so part of our uh, report form is really uh, often guiding clinicians to sources of information or inviting them to contact us to discuss the patient in greater detail. So let's look at a couple of individual patients and, and Howard, um, what do you think of this particular young lady? Right, so this is a young lady, she's uh, no clinical notes available, so we're not sure why she's uh, presented to her family practitioner, but one can clearly see she has a very elevated cholesterol there at 353 uh, milligrams per decilitre. Her uh, high density liver protein uh, cholesterol is uh, quite uh, adequate, but she also has this very high LDL cholesterol of 275 milligrams per decilitre. So David, I would see that this would, uh, she would be at increased risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, particularly because of just the high LDL. Uh, would that be an appropriate uh, comment or thought about, the, about this patient? Well, that's interesting, Howard. And look, I, I think maybe some of the issues that come forward here are a, a fairly standardised approach, first of all, which we can adopt for all patients, where I think we should think about potential secondary causes of the lipid disturbance, in this case, predominant hypercholesterolemia. Yes, for treatment decisions, we do want to tie things back to um, absolute risk, which of course involves other risk factors beyond lipids. I think we've gone past the days where we should put uh, the HDL to total cholesterol ratio on the form and then uh, quote a, a particular level of risk. That's insufficient information to carry out that exercise. But I think the main issue we'd like to raise here is uh, that young women are usually not at high risk of cardiovascular disease. In fact, uh, I'll comment further about that later on. But uh, in the situation, the specific situation of inherited risk with familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, 
there is a risk and we're very keen to uh, flag individuals who might have this particular problem. So looking at a standardised approach, uh, down the left hand side you'll see that I think it just helps notionally at a clinical level to think about whether the patient has uh, a predominant problem with cholesterol or a problem with triglyceride or a problem with both entities. Uh, of course, many lipid disorders are primary. They're due to either monogenetic or polygenetic uh, influences interacting with environmental factors. But I don't think we do have a responsibility to think through and consider secondary causes. And for such elevated cholesterol in this particular young lady, I think we'd be thinking of issues such as hypothyroidism, nephrotic syndrome, and cholestasis, particularly primary biliary cirrhosis, uh, which would generate uh, maybe suggestions for further laboratory testing. I think uh, we are keen for the clinician to try and add in important information such as clinical signs. I agree with the suggestion this lady might have familial hypercholesterolemia. It would be uh, of assistance in the diagnosis if the clinician indicated whether there were tendon xanthomas there or a premature corneal arcus. That would help with the diagnosis. Um, I think we're beyond the stage of the old Friedrichsen types in terms of uh, uh, trying to um, add diagnostic information. The Friedrichsen types are really just a, a shorthand for which particular lipoprotein is accumulating. Uh, I think the exercise is more about making specific uh, clinical diagnoses such as familial hypercholesterolemia and then uh, assessing the overall situation in terms of severity with uh, HDL, we can debate, uh, Traditionally, we've looked at LDL cholesterol levels, and increasingly, I'll make the case that we should be looking at non-HDL cholesterol levels. So here was the exercise in uh, maybe trying to work out this person's uh, absolute risk of a cardiovascular event. And you would comment that, first of all, this can be done sometimes with charts, which, uh, of course, sacrifice a lot of information. They, uh, uh, they bundle. Uh, lots of clinical information together uh, so that we don't have any degree of uh, severity for the diabetes, we don't have any degree of uh, severity for numbers of cigarettes smoked, etc., etc. However, uh, these risk calculators do uh, make an approximation of the level of risk of a, a coronary event in, in Australian situations, that calculations over the next five years. Uh, these uh, approaches also help with patient education, but the first thing you would have to say is that, that the, the, um, the uh, calculators are limited because of the epidemiology which underlies them. Uh, those uh, calculators did not really take uh, into account younger women and therefore our calculator is only qualified to estimate absolute risk over age 30, 35 for uh, some population groups and over 45 for most of the population. Um, and secondly, I make the point on the bottom right hand corner that the number of people with such severe hypercholesterolemia, and you can make the same case for blood pressure, the number of people in the epidemiological studies was small and therefore there is a lack of certainty and therefore the case is made that there are upper limits to the risk factor levels for which the risk calculators should be, should be used. So that fits in well with the concept of familial hypercholesterolemia because it really is a special case. It's a, a, a really a common condition. It's probably the most common potentially fatal genetic condition that we know about. A prevalence of, we think now, about 1 in 250. It's due to dominant mutations affecting the function of the LDL receptor, and that brings about a near doubling of the LDL cholesterol level in the plasma. Here you can see the idea of the LDL receptor capturing LDL particles, internalizing them. The LDL particle is broken down whilst the receptor itself recirculates uh, to maintain cholesterol, LDL cholesterol uptake. And so when this process is interrupted, it accelerates the onset of cardiovascular disease by about 20 to 40 years. And poor detection rates occur in many countries, and um, uh, I think that's a real question for um, uh, uh, health 
services because this is a golden opportunity to prevent uh, premature and avoidable cardiovascular disease. And just to convince you of the uh, degree to which it does accelerate cardiovascular disease, here you see men and women with and without familial hypercholesterolemia. And if taking a horizontal line, we compare the orange men with F familial hypercholesterolemia with the turquoise ones without, likewise the women with F of familial hypercholesterolemia in yellow and the green ones without, you'll see that the separation along the horizontal axis is around about 20 to 40 years. So uh, that's the sort of impact that we're talking about. Now, best practice for managing this condition is to try to detect as many uh, cases as we possibly can. And when we find the first case in the family, that's called the index case. And uh, techniques for doing this use the uh, level of the LDL cholesterol and the other uh, signs and, and um, clinical information that I mentioned to uh, calculate a score. Referred, uh, there are a number of different scores. We prefer the Dutch Lipid Clinic score. Uh, and if it is above a certain level, it starts to indicate that the presence of familial hypercholesterolemia is possible or probable or even definite. And the definite category comes about by the use of genetic diagnosis, so uh, sequencing as the LDL receptor gene or other related genes. And uh, that's what generates a definite result. However, the whole system can operate without the need for genetic testing. It can be done purely on a clinical basis. And we prefer to think of genetic testing in this situation as more of a tool to assist the other main strategy, and that is the strategy of familial cascade, uh, family cascade screening. And family cascade screening consists of investigating the first degree and second degree relatives of the uh, affected uh, index case because within about two years of investigating uh, such a family, we find around about eight affected individuals and another eight people who can be reassured they don't have the condition. And once different family members have been detected, we have uh, guidelines for uh, management throughout the whole of life, and those guidelines have been investigated and shown to be cost effective. Here we see that uh, statin treatment, and this is over a 12-year uh, follow-up that statin treatment was reducing cardiovascular event rates by nearly three quarters and around a 75% reduction in, in event rates. And another analysis in the right-hand panel, you'll see that although these interventions are uh, a cost to the health, uh, health service, by the time you get out past about four years of uh, this sort of management plan, the reduction in events uh, turns out to be cost saving. So a strong encouragement for us to do a good job of finding these people. And we've tried to, um, to augment this process in Australia through our laboratory reporting system. And through the College of Pathologists, we've uh, tried to standardize a comment on high LDL cholesterol results right across the country. And it's rather an interesting saga because we did the uh, we matched the um, uh, the distribution of LDL cholesterol levels in the community and the prevalence of the condition, and felt that we should be flagging LDL cholesterol results greater than uh, equal to or greater than six, uh, 250 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, however, when we worked with our our clinical users. Um, our GP population, they got very enthusiastic about it and wanted to flag everyone with LDL cholesterol levels greater than five. So uh, that was going to lead to a much less uh, specific, a more sensitive but less specific uh, uh, identification of patients. We felt that we had to go with uh, our users' advice, and so we've implemented the, the right-hand uh, comment, uh, but we've we were worried that, uh, in fact, it's going to uh, lead to a, a loss of specificity. So we are directing people to the, uh, the website there, which will provide them with access to the Dutch Lipid Clinic score via a calculator. And uh, hopefully, uh, their enthusiasm will be channeled in the right direction. 
different approaches exist in different countries, and one of the features of familial hypercholesterolemia is clear evidence of vascular damage at a, occurring at a young age with these very high cholesterol levels. On the top panel, you'll see just the issue that in uh, autopsies on Korean War victims, uh, many of whom were in their early 20s, uh, that the severity of already established cardiovascular disease was proportional to the number of risk factors. And in the bottom panel, you see uh, intermedial thickness measurements of patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, and you can see that uh, the affected population has accelerated thickening of the carotid wall indicative of early damage to the arteries. And so this has been harnessed in the US where some rather controversial guidelines have come out with the idea not so much necessarily of uh, looking for index cases, but rather screening the whole population at a young age, at your ages 9 and 17, in other words, either side of puberty, and universal screening with the aim of achieving two outcomes. First of all, um, detecting cases of familial hypercholesterolemia, and maybe then doing what we'd call um, uh, reverse reverse cascade screening, looking at uh, whether the parents of the children uh, had a problem. And the second intention of this rather controversial um, guideline has been that uh, it's aimed at also picking up the metabolic consequences of the rampant problem of childhood obesity. So uh, a rather different interpretation of lipid results in the US in children uh, because it is recommended as a universal screening strategy. So in summary, I think the important issue is to recognize the clinical features and causes of primary dyslipidemia. That includes the recognition of familial hypercholesterolemia uh, and that we've got uh, important strategies such as flagging very high uh, LDL or non-HDL cholesterol levels, um, assessing the likelihood of the diagnosis with the Dutch Lipid Clinic score and then following up with family cascade screening uh, where genetic testing uh, is a supplement but not a necessity. So with that we might uh, move on to a, a different sort of case scenario, Howard, what, what do you Oh think? yes, so here we have a, a more uh, traditional uh, patient presenting with uh, lipid studies with a male who's 67 years of age and uh, has a type 2 diabetes and just looking at the uh, baseline uh, uh, results uh, it's evident that this patient has an elevated triglyceride at 264 milligrams per deciliter. And I think uh, elevation, diabetes, is uh, a factor which gives rise to increased triglycerides. Is that correct, uh, David? Yes, thanks, Howard. Yes, I think um, if you like to think of type 2 diabetes as fuel overload, I think uh, macronutrients allow us to have the fuel overload in terms of either carbohydrate, i.e. glucose, or uh, lipid, i.e. triglyceride, and um, it, it's, I think, uh, logical then to realize that if you've got fuel overload, uh, once you've got it in one form, it's likely that you might get it in the other form as well, and so not only is high triglyceride associated with uh, the diabetic state, but also I think uh, in many cases an elevated triglyceride without diabetes is a harbinger of future risk and, uh, uh, and I think that might often help to motivate patients. So once the triglyceride is elevated, I think some of the other important consequences arise as a, a, um, a result of an entity known as cholesterol ester transfer protein and it might be worth a quick aside here to say that we were developing what we thought was going to be a marvelous treatment for this situation. We had drugs which inhibited cholesterol ester transfer protein, and you'll appreciate from what we're about to say that they did a great job of lowering uh, LDL cholesterol further, of boosting HDL, making the picture look much, much better. Uh, but unfortunately, for the third time uh, in recent history, a drug of this type has uh, ceased investigation because of lack of benefits. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, we don't have the easy answer we thought we were going to get just around the corner. 
Um, however, I will just, while this slides up, make the point that the typical picture in type 2 diabetes is one of high triglyceride, low HDL. Triglyceride and HDL often reciprocal to each other. And the LDL cholesterol, you'll note, isn't particularly high. In fact, it's at target levels for our um, secondary prevention patients. And so you might ask the question, do we need to do anything about this, this patient's lipid level? And first of all, let's appreciate what's actually happened to the lipid level, looking at the role of this entity cholesterol ester transfer protein, because cholesterol ester transfer protein really just allows lipids to swap between lipoprotein particles, and in doing so, the lipids just redistribute down their concentration gradients. So the triglyceride-rich particles, particularly very low-density lipoproteins, VLDL, um, have lots of triglyceride. The cholesterol-rich particles, and here you could have either LDL or HDL, they're rich in cholesterol. So when cholesterol ester transfer protein is available, it allows the swapping of triglyceride for cholesterol. And so if we look in the bottom panel, at the cholesterol-rich particles, they lose cholesterol ester and have it replaced by triglyceride under the action of CTP, that uh, left-hand arrow between the orange particles. In the right-hand panel, you'll then see that the triglyceride, which is a fuel, just gets used up, and therefore the particle uh, moves to a new state where it's actually become smaller. And uh, uh, and so this is the process which brings about reduction in, LDL, in HDL cholesterol levels and the production of so-called small dense LDL. The low HDL is probably largely due to the fact that the smaller particles aren't too stable and they tend to get catabolized. Uh, but, in VL, uh, but in LDL, the particles are still stable. They just exist in this smaller denser state. And, and just to uh, reiterate that, here is another example with the triglyceride-rich uh, particle on the left, uh, having the lipid exchange under cholesterol ester transfer protein, and then having the triglyceride in the cholesterol-rich particle uh, consumed, leaving a smaller, denser particle. This particularly happens when triglyceride levels are elevated. That is causing a change in the cholesterol content, size and composition and density of the cholesterol-rich particles. And in the case of LDL, it's making them smaller and denser. But one of the consequences of this is that when triglyceride is elevated, there will be more LDL particles than you might appreciate from the LDL cholesterol level. The, damp the risk is on a per-particle basis, and therefore, the LDL cholesterol in this situation may underestimate the risk uh, and patients uh, may be uh, undertreated on that basis. And so people sometimes go to huge lengths to designate whether a patient has uh, the light fluffy LDL or the small dense LDL, the phenotype A or the phenotype B, but in many ways it's simply a surrogate for the triglyceride level. And here you see a plot of increasing triglyceride levels and the transition from the phenotype A to the phenotype B. Uh, I think as laboratories we can guide our users as to when uh, the uh, assessment for the presence of small dense LDL may or may not be useful. And in the process of, assess of assessing that phenotype, uh, the method often involves radiant gel electrophoresis, and we come up with a diameter for the particles. However, it should be pointed out that that diameter looks quantitative, but it's really qualitative. It's just telling us whether the particles are small or whether they're normal size. Then it's not telling us the number of particles, and therefore I don't think the, the test in itself is particularly uh, useful in terms of a final designation of the amount of risk. The issue of risk hinges purely on the number of particles. Here you see from the Quebec Heart Study, in the orange bars, you see the comparison between large and small LDL, uh, and provided there is no increase in their number, there, uh, uh, in this study there was no increase in risk. In the, in the back turquoise bars, you see that when uh, there is an increased number of LDL particles, 
it is particularly harmful when the particles are small and dense, probably largely because it's been uh, misinterpreted as not being as high as people think it is. Uh, and, it, and so small dense LDL, the main issue is, uh, is there an increased number of these particles? This then causes some, uh, highlights the problems I alluded to earlier as far as the LDL cholesterol level is concerned. So the LDL cholesterol level, uh, when uh, small dense particles are present, is no longer reflecting the number of particles terribly well. We can judge the number of particles by the measurement of ApoB. There is one ApoB molecule per uh, atherogenic particle. And you can see that the correlation is only modest between LDL and ApoB, and the discordance is really quite high. So it's over 50%. So that's uh, saying that the the, FOB, the uh, LDL levels are, are scattered fairly widely around the FOB uh, median. Now, if we take the case of non-HDL cholesterol, which can be more simply derived than LDL cholesterol, you see that, in fact, the correlation is better and the level of discordance is less. So this actually makes a case that rather than rely, continuing to rely on LDL cholesterol, we would actually do better to move off uh, in the direction of paying more attention to non-HDL cholesterol. And, and this has been borne out in uh, clinical studies, and here you see the degree of risk predicted by the LDL cholesterol in the US Health Professional Study. Uh, it, it's certainly significant, but it was surpassed by the non-HDL cholesterol level, which was getting up towards the levels of what was seen by uh, the preferred measurement of ApoB. And that's also borne out in uh, looking at the issue of discordance uh, from the Framingham off spring study. You can see that uh, in yellow, when both the LDL cholesterol and the LDL particle number agree, yes, of course, uh, if the, if the um, uh, levels are low for both, then the uh, risk is also low. But in white, you see that if they are discordant if the LDL particle number is still low but the LDL cholesterol level is high, uh, the risk remains low. And conversely, uh, in the bottom line there, you see that if the LDL particle number is high and the LDL cholesterol is low, then in fact uh, survival is worse. So the actual clinical events are tracking with particle number, not with LDL cholesterol content. And finally, just to make another point as to why LDL cholesterol levels may become less, uh, may become, uh, less useful in the future or less relied upon, uh, this is information from trials with very aggressive cholesterol lowering using new therapies. And you can see that uh, the calculated LDL cholesterol level uh, using the Friedwald equation which is our main, main, method, main method of obtaining an, an LDL cholesterol, uh, that, that becomes very unreliable when we're dealing with very low levels of LDL cholesterol as determined by ultracentrifugation. And you can see from the different colored bars there, with the green bar getting up towards uh, to a 70% difference, uh, that this particularly happens when triglyceride levels are elevated, uh, again, an expression of this uh, formation of small dense LDL. So in summary, I think we're looking at <coughs> a declining reliance on LDL cholesterol as the diagnostic threshold or treatment target, and we're looking at maybe replacement with the simple calculation of non-HDL cholesterol, which is just the total minus the HDL cholesterol, a simpler alternative that may offer a better clinical performance. So um, uh, maybe we can sort of sustain a little bit of that theme with this particular case, uh, uh, Howard, where we're dealing with a non-fasting state. Yes, I see this is, uh, again, a middle-aged male and non-fasting. Again, triglycerides are elevated, uh, significantly elevated, and the cholesterol this time is uh, also uh, above the desirable level. But as you've reported here, that the LDL cholesterol is unsuitable for uh, reporting. So uh, could you just explain that a bit further, David? Yes, thanks, Howard. Um, yes, so uh, I suppose uh, maybe the uh, 
note that the LDL cholesterol is not suitable um, uh, might imply that we don't think we get much information out of a non-fasting sample and uh, wouldn't it be easier for our patients if they could uh, avoid the need to fast for lipid measurement? Um, so look, I think there are some pros and cons as far as that's concerned. Uh, the underlying problem here is mixed hyperlipidemia uh, and um, we need to deal with that on its merits. But uh, I'm, I'm really using this as an ex just an excuse to explore uh, some of the implications about non-fasting measurements. And one of the first points to make is that uh, the non-fasting state, of course, is the state that prevails most of the time in, in humans uh, in our society and therefore uh, maybe not to measure uh, uh, patients who have had a, a meal is, is doing them a disservice because um, it's not reflecting their usual metabolic situation. And encouraged by this thought, uh, maybe even encouraged by the thought that uh, perhaps there are p certain elements in the, in the postprandial state which are likely to promote uh, artery damage. The group in Copenhagen have looked at non-fasting triglyceride levels and they've looked particularly at levels around about four hours after whatever the recent meal had been and they find it's actually uh, uh, quite sensitively predictive of, uh, in the top I think you see females, in the bottom you see men and it's predictive for both uh, myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease and indeed total death and, and particularly predictive in the case of women. So uh, non-fasting triglyceride level, a strong predictor of cardiovascular status in women. And so on the one hand we have the fact that a fasting measurement uh, avoids the presence of chylomicrons and that's an assumption that we make when we do the feed wall calculation of LDL cholesterol. And secondly, it standardizes triglyceride measurement for the diagnosis of hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, obviously, um, we do need a degree of standardization in that situation. On the other hand, um, it stopped the, fast, the failure to fast doesn't make that much impact on the total cholesterol or the actual ultracentrifuge LDL cholesterol level or the non-HDL cholesterol level that we've just been uh, recommending. It does make a modest impact on HDL cholesterol. It causes, I think, a, usually a temporary decrease due to those exchange processes we noted earlier. Um, and I've just raised the issue that maybe it's a more sensitive marker of cardiovascular risk and total mortality. Um, now, if we were to take the converse point of view and say, okay, what about doing postprandial measurements? Can we standardize those measurements in any way? I don't think so. I think we'd be looking, having to look at the composition and dose of the meal. We'd be looking at uh, what its physiological relevance was. We'd wonder, I think there'd still be issues about the background diet, the gastric emptying time. Uh, after we'd had a meal, there'd be all sorts of different time points we could choose. We could measure all sorts of different parameters. Uh, it would be very difficult to know how to present the data. It may be worth just pointing out that there are some specific markers that, that um, reflect some aspects of postprandial metabolism. Uh, we've used retinyl ester levels in the past and after a retinyl ester load and we've, we've also used the measurement of uh, APOB48. Um, and, and I suppose these things could be pursued if, if we really believe that um, the risk of artery damage is greater after a meal. Uh, certainly a time when there's a flux of dietary cholesterol, uh, it's a time when there's competition for the LDL receptor. We see activation of factor seven on the surfaces of chylomicrons. I guess the main question is whether chylomicron remnants can penetrate the artery wall. And uh, there have been quite elegant studies looking at changes in vascular reactivity after different types of meals. Uh, and I must confess that I think the literature there tends to uh, be a little bit inconsistent. So trying to come to a final conclusion on these things. Uh, postprandial testing really is unstandardized in terms of the timing, uh, the delay uh, of gastric emptying, and the fat content of the preceding meal. On the other hand, 
its lack of impact on some parameters means that it is adequate for assessment of total cholesterol and HDL, I think, for the purposes of the absolute risk calculations that we mentioned earlier. Um, I think it's also adequate for the calculation of non-HDL cholesterol, uh, and we've already seen that this is superior to uh, LDL cholesterol, particularly calculated LDL cholesterol. Uh, so again, an encouragement maybe that we could think about using non-fasting, non-HDL cholesterol, which is usually around about 0.5 to 0.8 of a millimole per litre higher than the LDL cholesterol targets and cutoffs that we've tended to use in the past. And so um, maybe non-fasting samples are adequate, adequate unless we're calculating LDL cholesterol or we're diagnosing hypertroglyceridemia. Now, many of these comments are personal views and people might want to take me up on them. Uh, but I'll, I'll just sort of summarise them as personal views that non-fasting lipid and lipoprotein testing may better reflect the predominant metabolic state. It may better reflect the atherogenicity of the postprandial state. It may be sufficient to derive total and HDL cholesterol for absolute risk assessment. It may be sufficient to calculate non-HDL cholesterol as a preferable measure of atherogenic lipoproteins and it may be of practical help in facilitated management of, of individual patients, uh, saving them a certain degree of in, inconvenience. So I don't know if you want to take me up on any of those, uh, Howard, or, or move on to another case. No, I think we'll move on to another case. And uh, once again, you've uh, presented data from a middle-aged woman, and this time she's clinically well and presumably has gone to a medical family practitioner uh, to get a really a health test as opposed to a diagnosis for any disease. So she's gone along, and what we can see quickly looking at the, at the various uh, levels is that the LDL cholesterol is quite... Uh, is low at 19 milligrams per deciliter and therefore one would think this woman is uh, very healthy from a cardiovascular uh, aspect. Uh, is that the case, David? I think it is the case, Howard, um, and, uh, and we'll go into some of the detail. However, um, it's also been an area of concern. I think um, it, uh, it needs to be acknowledged that illness in most of its forms will be a secondary cause of low cholesterol and so uh, of course that's generated concern that low cholesterol might be causative of some disease states and those ideas have been expressed in areas such as uh, the risk of cancer and so forth. However we do have some interesting um, natural experiments by way of genetic abnormalities and I think they reassure us that, uh, that de novo low cholesterol is not a source of concern and therefore this can be extrapolated for us to take reassurance that by lowering people's cholesterol levels we're not placing them at risk of non-cardiovascular disease. The, the hint here on this lady's results that makes me think that this is a primary advantageous situation rather than um, a low cholesterol secondary to some other worrying undiagnosed uh, situation is that the low cholesterols of, uh, which are associated with uh, intercurrent disease would usually be a reduction in both LDL and HDL. And as we can see in this particular lady, the HDL is well sustained and that's really what's led to the uh, particular exaggeration of the low LDL cholesterol level. And so look, there are a number of low lipid conditions. Um, ones I've highlighted here, I guess, have maybe uh, particularly highlighted uh, low HDL and on the right hand side you'll see that uh, we've been familiar for a long time with um, some low LDL cholesterol conditions. Um, first of all uh, a condition called A-beta lipoproteinemia where the, lipo where the, um, uh, the cascade of particles carrying triglyceride and cholesterol uh, towards uh, the periphery, uh, the uh, formation is inhibited by lack of uh, one of the participating entities known as microsomal transfer protein. We have a different model of uh, a lack of these particles brought about by abnormalities of apolipoprotein B and the severity in those situations usually tracks with uh, the degree to which the ApoB molecule is disrupted. If it's disrupted to less than half its length, then uh, it's going to start to in uh, affect the uh, 
postcranial metabolism as well. But down, down the bottom, I'll highlight a, a newer entity that we've become aware of, which is deficiency of an entity known as PCSK9, that stands for Proprotein Convertase Subtilin Kexin 9, and uh, that's given an appreciation of an extra dimension in cholesterol metabolism, and it's also uh, gone on to have some uh, very useful clinical applications. So here again is our differential diagnosis of low cholesterol, triglyceride, and APOB. Uh, the complete lack of the particles, as I mentioned, due to the lack of the microsomal transfer protein, uh, bringing about a beta lipoproteinemia, or the more modest reduction in FOB particles brought about by the mutations in FOB, and this final entity at the bottom, the, the PCSK9 mutations. I've put up again the diagram of our LDL receptor removing LDL particles from the circulation and, uh, and having the LDL particle catabolized in the lysosome. And you'll notice that the um, recircula recirculation of the receptors for reuse on the surface has been greyed out because that recy recycling depends on the absence of PCSK9. Um, and when PCSK9 is present, it redirects the LDL particles and the receptor so that, they, so that the whole complex goes to the lysosome, and not only is the LDL broken down, but also the PCSK9 and also the LDL receptor. So we have um, a fine-tuning, if you like, of LDL receptor function and plasma cholesterol levels, and indeed intracellular cholesterol. And we learned these notions from cases of familial hypercholesterolemia in which we couldn't find a defect in the LDL receptor, and we found that in fact the situation was arising from again a function mutation in the PCSK9, leading to increased catabolism of LDL receptors and the full familial hypercholesterolemia picture. And a bit of uh, lateral thinking said, well, look, if too much is bad for you, not enough might be good for you, and a search was undertaken for families in which there were PCSK9 loss of function mutations. They were detected. These were individuals in which PCSK9 levels were lowered. In fact, the LDL receptors were more prevalent in these patients. Their LDL cholesterol levels were around about 30% lower. You can see this in the comparison of two populations with and without a PCSK9 loss of function mutation in the left-hand panel, panel. The right-hand, uh, sorry, the uh, the uh, left-hand uh, white population with um, the mutation present had their cholesterol levels shifted to the left. They had around about an, a 30% reduction in their LDL cholesterol levels. And over a 15-year observation period, you can see in the right-hand panel that this provided them with a 90% protection against cardiovascular disease. So, uh, so this was uh, extremely encouraging and is, has, in fact, been leveraged uh, in, in order to provide a, a novel form of treatment. And amongst the observations of those families, there were two individuals who were detected who were homozygous for PCSK9 loss of function mutations, and here you see their two lipid profiles, uh, very low cholesterol levels, and extremely low LDL cholesterol levels. All of the cholesterol that was prevailing was uh, still tied up with uh, HDL cholesterol rather than LDL. So these two young women had LDL cholesterol levels similar to the case that I showed you at the start, uh, around about 15 milligrams per deciliter, but they were completely healthy, uh, they'd had normal uh, family reproductive uh, function. They were uh, high achievers in terms of uh, cognitive function. Uh, they had no musculoskeletal symptoms, etc. They enjoyed what is essentially perfect health. And that really agrees with our um, other genetic studies in PCSK9 knockout mice, which also have extremely low LDL cholesterol levels. They, too, have normal fertility and development. So here I think is very strong encouragement that very low LDL cholesterol levels uh, achieved by genetic or therapeutic means do not present a, a, a long-term risk. 
So rarer causes of dyslipidemia have led to some important treatment discoveries, and one such condition, PCSK9 deficiency, has led to novel antibody therapy, uh, which is uh, a source of excitement at the moment. Uh, and extreme cases of low lipids suggest that loss of cholesterol is not harmful, provided that fat-soluble vitamin levels remain adequate. So, um, okay. So we have that. now another case of, of a. Thank you, David. That's a very interesting concept. Um, we have our fifth case, which is a male, again middle-aged male, but this time with most abnormal uh, lipids, with a, a very high uh, triglyceride level, as well as hypercholesterolemia. The LD, the HDL cholesterol is in is low, and uh, and and of we can't calculate the LDL cholesterol because of this uh, high level of triglycerides. So what do you think here in terms of um, informing the general practitioner who's, uh, who's, who's, who this is seeing this patient? Oh, thanks, Howard. Look, I think uh, often there's a lot of misconception about this. Um, I might just quickly, first of all, highlight that, yes, it is unsuitable to calculate the LDL LDL cholesterol using the free to world equation in this situation. Uh, the, the calculation should be limited to situations in which triglyceride is less than 4 millimoles per litre, uh, or, or, um, which I think is around about, um, three, around about 400 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, if you do the calculation of higher levels, uh, you can end up getting some ridiculous results. And if, in fact, if you did it in this particular individual, um, you would have a negative result for your LDL cholesterol because you'd be subtracting uh, a larger than, than uh, appropriate number. Uh, and of course, um, that, that's a ridiculous result. I think it would uh, confuse and bewilder uh, our clinical colleagues, uh, but I have seen those sorts of results reported. Um, so it is uh, important to identify that LDL cholesterol calculation is not, not suitable in this, this specimen is not suitable uh, in this particular set of circumstances. Many, uh, on the next slide you'll, uh, a, a, a patient with uh, a, a set of results like this would probably have blood that looks something like that and um, I don't think uh, labs um, particularly like handling that sort of a specimen for a variety of reasons and just to um, uh, flash through a couple of concepts here. The results did include a cholesterol that was over 10, and I think it's, it's not terribly widely appreciated that even though that total cholesterol is high, the LDL cholesterol, I think many people assume it to be high when that is not the case. It's going to be very low, partly because of those exchange mechanisms that we mentioned previously, and, uh, and of course, um, uh, the, the, um, this is part of the reason why the Friedel Wald equation is, is not uh, suitable in this situation. The second thing is, of course, it's likely to cause some artifacts. Uh, you often see dilutional effects here where the sodium level uh, might be artifactually low. Uh, you're really getting displacement effects from the, from the lipids. And the last thing is that with these drastic results, non-experienced clinicians are likely to make that assumption and think that the LDL cholesterol is still high and, and have concern about the risk of cardiovascular disease, where in fact the risk is entirely different in this situation. The risk in this situation is one of acute pancreatitis. Uh, this has to do with our concept of the blood supply of the pancreas, where uh, the capillary network through the pancreas probably allows a little bit of backward diffusion of uh, uh, pancreatic lipase as it's produced for exocrine use uh, and you could imagine that if a tiny bit of uh, pancreatic lipase leaches back into a capillary where uh, triglyceride levels are so grossly elevated that it will break down the available triglyceride in the blood rather than in the intestine and that the release of free fatty acids will then increase the membrane permeability leading to a vicious cycle where essentially the, the patient starts to digest themselves from the inside out. So uh, this massive hypertriglyceridemia poses uh, 
uh, a risk of acute pancreatitis, uh, a very a hazardous condition with a high mortality rate. So uh, it, it's actually probably more of a medical emergency than most of our other lipid uh, profiles would present. Just to think a little bit about what's going on, uh, what, what's being disrupted here is the process of uh, extraction of triglycerides from triglyceride-rich particles, both chylomicrons and DLDL. Um, and so that usually requires uh, lipoprotein lipase acting with its cofactor APOC2. We can have genetic absence of either the enzyme itself or the cofactor, which of course would lead to uh, massive hypertriglyceridemia as might be anticipated. This would often occur at young age, and so in the case of our patient being 45 years old, and this maybe being the first episode, we've also got to imagine some other circumstances, and these other circumstances make this massive hypertriglyceridemia a more common problem than it would be if it was occurring purely on the basis of recessive genetic disorders. So probably polygenetic factors lead to groups of patients in whom lipoprotein lipase activity is diminished but not absent. And in those individuals, if the triglyceride removal lags behind and they're exposed to an exacerbating factor, whether it be a high-fat diet or the emergence of diabetes or obesity or those sorts of things, we eventually reach a stage where the lipoprotein lipase is fully saturated by the available circulating triglyceride. Therefore, when the next meal comes along, the next batch of triglyceride just gets dumped on top of that, uh, and we start to see a backlog of triglyceride in the circulation, and indeed that will take off in an exponential fashion so that the triglyceride level merely reflects the amount of fat which is being recently consumed. And so uh, a previously uh, mildly elevated triglyceride of 3 or 4 millimoles per litre can suddenly exacerbate up towards 10, 20, 40, 70, 100 very high levels of uh, LDL cholesterol, uh, of uh, uh, circulating triglyceride. Sorry, I gave you those last representative figures in millimoles per litre, so in other words, your, your uh, triglyceride level of 200 can suddenly take off, uh, sorry, of, of about 400 can suddenly take off to 1,500, 3,000, 4,000, etc. So in summary, massive hypertriglyceridemia poses a risk of acute pancreatitis. Chylomicrons persist if lipoprotein lipase is deficient or saturated. Those polygenetic predispositions to reduce lipoprotein lipase activity <coughs> may hinge on uh, other genetic influences on lipoprotein lipase, APOC2, APOA5, etc. And laboratory artifacts may arise due to the turbidity and volume displacement effects of these uh, chylomicron pres particles present in the circulation. And so I think that might bring us to our last case. All right then, so this is a, uh, a middle-aged woman again who's this time is uh, presenting after she's already had a heart attack at some stage and she's on therapy for cholesterol, lowering cholesterol and uh, she's getting some, it seems to be some effects, uh, beneficial effects. Um, would the target values that you have here be for this patient be the same as for a patient who is not receiving or hasn't had this uh, this history, David? Um, I, I think they would be different. I think they would be lower and more aggressive in this case. In fact, uh, the target that I would have in mind would be a target of less than 1.8 millimoles per litre or a target of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. We've recently completed a trial called Improve It, which proved the benefit of, it, of aggressive... Hello, David. It looks like your phone problem is there. Uh, I'm still on speakerphone. Can you hear me, Howard? Uh, you yeah, hear me? David, I'm having trouble. We're having trouble. Uh, uh... Okay. I'll, I'll just um, pick up the... I'm using my handset now. Is that any better? Hello? 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 Hi, David. Hello. Yeah, uh, Don, I'm, I'm, I've picked up a handset. Um, I, I didn't do anything. I think um, I can see the, the bar circulating for reconnecting. 
Hello? Hello, David. We can continue on, David. I think we lost our. Okay. Um, I'll go. Uh, I'll stay on the handset. Might be um, best for the moment. Um, I've got a circulating bar saying connecting, but you're right for me to go ahead. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, look. Just continuing um, to highlight that patients who have established symptomatic cardiovascular disease usually do qualify for more aggressive target, uh, particularly, uh, we're saying target LDL cholesterol levels here because that's what's been traditional. Um, the recent improved study which used more aggressive treatment including azetamibe um, has showed a benefit in patients who had LDL cholesterol levels down at 1.4 compared to 1.8 in the um, in the standard treatment group and so I think there is a possibility that um, target levels for patients with cardiovascular disease may be further reduced in the future um, and with that in mind um, I guess uh, treatment is going to be a little bit more aggressive and in that process people may uh, raise questions about the possibility of side effects and so you'll see that this particular patient has uh, mild elevation of liver function tests, mild elevation of CK level and um, just uh, I think also to, in, to try to explain why the patient might have had cardiovascular disease in the first place I've just highlighted that the patient's got an elevated lipoprotein little a level and so I'd like to maybe look at these three issues. Uh, so uh, the first point to make is that uh, the benefit of Cholesterol lowering, I think, is very well established. Uh, this is the cholesterol uh, trialist collaboration showing the benefit e even in primary prevention. So this is uh, patients who are um, yet to have cardiovascular events and therefore um, would be uh, even uh, more difficult in, in whom to demonstrate a benefit, but the benefit is clear. Um, their analysis of also large numbers of patients also establishes I think the placebo-controlled side effect rates of statin therapy pointing out uh, a mild but uh, important risk of new-onset diabetes, a, um, a, a modest risk of hemorrhagic stroke, but, a, but that's overshadowed by the uh, prevention of um, non-hemorrhagic uh, hemorrhagic stroke. A really quite low rate of myopathy uh, and an even lower rate of the serious rhabdomyolysis you won't see any mention of liver function test abnormalities there, nor will you see any mention of um, uh, of um, liver dysfunction. And I think recent FDA analysis has been reassuring that even when statins are used in the presence of non-ideal liver function tests, the uh, experience suggests that it is very, very unlikely that statins contribute to the onset of uh, long-term liver dysfunction um, as a result of a, a hepatitic effect. So uh, there's now a good level of confidence for continuing to use statins in situations like fatty liver disease, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the point I made about the uh, lipoprotein little a is that uh, I think this is a an exciting area of laboratory medicine. Lipoprotein little a is a special fraction of the LDL um, cholesterol. Uh, it, it is distinguished by the presence of a, a unique uh, plasminogen-like lipo, uh, apolipoprotein um, and the whole entity known as lipoprotein little a seems to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. This may be because it may uh, interfere with spontaneous thrombolysis. It may be particularly likely to uh, uh, potentiate atherogenic part, uh, processes. We're uh, of the opinion that levels in the 
uh, top 20% to 30% of the population represent uh, an additional risk factor and uh, that probably represents a level above around about 500 milligrams per deciliter or uh, sorry, uh, uh, above um, 50 milligrams per deciliter, above about 500 milligrams per litre. Uh, and um, this impression has also reinforced by Mendelian randomization studies. So lipoprotein little a, I think, uh, is a uh, risk factor for, um, uh, for um, cardiovascular disease. I point out that it's not actually reduced by statin therapy, but um, thankfully uh, is now treatable with some of our novel agents such as anti-PCSK9 antibodies. Um, again, just re reinforcing the message that liver function test abnormalities in, in conjunction with statin therapy rarely progress to liver damage and uh, point that uh, uh, frank statin myopathy uh, sufficient to cause serious elevation of CK is rare. We do, however, however, often see mild CK elevation in the setting of statin therapy and indeed in the, in the general population. So maybe the, just to sum up then, just if we come back to our, our bread and butter lipid tests, total cholesterol is one of the components of absolute risk assessment. Uh, if taken in isolation, it's confounded with respect to cardiovascular risk because it's compromised by anti- and pro-atherogenic lipoproteins, and it's the starting point for calculations that aim to quantitate the amount of atherogenic lipoprotein, uh, LDL cholesterol, and, and increasingly non-HDL cholesterol. HDL cholesterol uh, is... Um, of continuing interest. Uh, we're starting now to think more about its fun functional aspects. Um, direct methods uh, involve selective recognition of um, HDL cholesterol and some of the early assays I think were a little bit uh, affected uh, in the setting of uh, increased triglyceride levels. Uh, we should be used to the idea that uh, those exchange processes we mentioned earlier tend to slightly lower HDL uh, in postprandial samples. And finally, fasting triglyceride standardize, standardizes the calculation of LDL cholesterol and defines levels for diagnosis and treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, Non-fasting levels are um, uh, maybe a more sensitive way of detecting cardiovascular risk. Uh, and hypertriglyceridemia in general, both fasting and postprandial, may influence LDL composition, size and density um, and, of course, very high levels uh, pose a risk of pancreatitis. Uh, triglyceride and HDL, um, as you, I think, appreciate by now, do tend to uh, uh, have an inverse relationship with each other. So I should conclude at that point. Um, I'll just uh, leave things open for questions or comments. And um, otherwise, I thank everyone for their... Uh, their um, participation and uh, wish you well for the, the rest of the meeting. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, and thanks for that great presentation. Uh, before we go into Q&A, I just want to remind the audience how to submit questions. Uh, they can type them in uh, the Q&A, the green Q&A button there. You can click on that, uh, type in your question, and uh, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can here before the end of the session. Um, so we'll just give you a minute there to submit any questions you might have. And don't be shy. Okay, well, David, do you have any other uh, comments uh, that you want to make? Uh, look, thanks. Uh, Don, look, I'd be happy to take uh, questions in um, uh, over over the uh, following period of time. I think the first slide had my email address, and um, I I'm just uh, uh, honoured to have been able to participate. And I realise that we are speaking to many parts of the world. Um, I'd love to hear other people's uh, uh, perspectives and comments. Mine have been. Uh, from down under, and uh, we're always um, aware that um, 
there need to be local interpretations. Indeed, that's sort of one of the um, main messages about absolute risk is that our absolute risk calculators should be harmonised to uh, local requirements. So um, I do look forward to any further questions that come through and otherwise I thank you very much uh, for uh, this opportunity. Best wishes to everyone. Thanks again, David. Okay. So uh, this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing uh, through April of 2016 and you'll be getting an email from LabRoots that will alert you uh, when this webcast is available for replay from on demand. And we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's event. So until next time, thanks a lot. Goodbye.